So moving on to the castrate resistance space, uh, let's say that you've given a patient dose taxel and uh, ADT and you're six, 12 months into it and your PSA is still four, patient's PSA is still four and beginning to rise. Where do you go next? Well, if the PSA starts rising, I will go then to a next generation antiandrogen such as abiraterone or enzalutamide uh, as the first treatment. I also think of CIPT in that situation yep. as well. Um, CIPT from the data should be given early uh, before the PSA gets to 22 is one of the thoughts. Uh, but remember, back to the impact trial, there were patients who had chemotherapy on that study. I know. So the, and the median a, PSA was like 100 and something. E exactly. But I, I think that it's, it's underused, and I think it's underappreciated, but it is a drug that does, it is a process that has activity, and it, it is a proven survival benefit. With right. It. At, at ASCO, uh, or ASCO GU this year, there was an interesting uh, database analysis showing in not a multivariate, but a certain single variate, that the CIPT uh, in the era of uh, secondary, second antiandrogen therapy was still showing a survival advantage. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're, we're sort of still under appreciating and not fully understanding the important role of CIPT in these patients. Exactly. And also, I think, too, in underserved populations such as African Americans, we know that CIPT seems to have a better survival benefit. Same thing with chemotherapy if you adjust for the different poor prognostic factors. So I think that also um, uh, lends to the fact that for patients from, uh, di from different uh, ethnic backgrounds, we also should consider that in terms of our treatments. So moving then to the sort of refractory castrate resistant space or landscape, uh, where, do, where do you see as uh, having had the most impact in the last several years? Um, I, I think, again, the... Uh, after, this would be after 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 CIP T. Yeah. Is it the radium? Uh, is it uh, cabazitaxel? Is it PARP inhibitors? There, I, I think right now the PARP inhibitors are going to have the most influence. And and in some of the patients that I've treated, both on and off study, I've seen some fairly dramatic and long term responses. But in small populations. In small populations. Is the, is the so problem. again, it's the issue. The issue is really trying to. Uh, assess, number one, we all have to check our patients molecularly now. Right. This is now yeah. an absolute, absolute, you have to check them for MSI, you have to check them now for DNA repair mutations because we can make an impact on our patient's care by administering yeah. drugs based upon these particular markers. Yeah, it's interesting. I just found two patients with Lynch syndrome uh, mm -hmm. just by molecular testing, not a very strong family mm -hmm. history at all. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, it's like, well, look at that. You know, therefore, you have the Nevo Ipi or Pembro option for those patients. Exactly. Yeah. So, in the in the sequencing changing landscape, CIPT, you still have radium in there, and then you have Jevtana, mm -hmm. uh, Cabazitaxel, right. and then you have the uh, PARP inhibitors. What's your sort of preferred sequence at that level? So, my preferred sequence is to go first with next generation antiandrogen after CIPT, then to docetaxel chemotherapy then to cabazitaxel chemotherapy, and then radium at some point if they have bone-only disease or if perhaps between the time they've had docetaxel and cabazitaxel if they need a break from, from that type of treatment. Yeah. So radium, uh, there was an int intriguing uh, work from Antonarakis uh, uh, looking at CIPT and radium. Mm -hmm. uh, I was intrigued by that because there were four PSA uh, s steep declines yeah in a small population of patients, which we don't usually see with either radium or CIPT. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think it's, very, it's a very interesting uh, biological observation. I think what also was interesting about that study is the fact that they looked at immune parameters, and we would have expected that there would have been some upregulation of immune function because of the obscopal effect that we see with radiation therapy. We saw actually the opposite, that there was a downregulation of, of some of the immune parameters they were yeah, looking at. Yeah. So. I think the PSA uh, observation is very, very intriguing. You do see some PSA declines with CIPT. I've seen it, and I've seen it with radium as well. Mm. But the question really is, are we going to be getting more? And then mechanistically, what's the real real uh, issue here? We're, we're seeing more and more now that we're taking drugs and combining them that may have had little activity as single agents and seeing some very, very interesting synergistic patterns. I remember when uh, Crystal Gathetis uh, wrote the editorial about Alsimka. Um, and he, he made the, I think, quite intelligent and insightful observation. He said, we're affecting the stroma. Um, we don't know much about the stroma. 
and what that means in terms of supporting and allowing the growth of prostate cancer. And the bone marrow stroma is, an, is a target that really has not been addressed except potentially with cabomedics. Exactly. Uh, and cabozantinib is an interesting drug. Where do you see those kind of drugs going, and particularly the TKI combinations? One of the most exciting abstracts at this meeting was the combination of uh, cabozantinib along with atezolizumab. Both of these drugs really have as an objective response rate and by PSA response is a less than 10% rate. And we're seeing a 28% rate of, of tumor shrinkage with, with responses in, in visceral sites such as liver. So I, I think that, that we have to really understand more about the biology of, of the immune function. We know the CABO can cause the uh, reduction of myeloid suppressor cells, and this may be a way that we can be, uh, convert a cold tumor to a hot tumor, mm. and then we hit, hit it with a checkpoint inhibitor. So I think this is, I think, one of the fun things about being in this business right now, that the biology is all coming to a focus, and we're understanding more about how to better take care of patients. Yeah, it's a very complicated time because we're be able now for the first time to be able to combine agents. Uh, and moreover, we're seeing longer and longer uh, re response durations. Well, I, I think too, the, the fact that you mentioned about the stroma, we've always been, had tunnel vision and thinking about the tumor cell only. Now we have to think about this in terms of the environment and the, the actual patient and how th there's an interaction between the stroma and the tumor. And um, also, um, how the biology changes as you give drugs over time. You know, the emergence of the neuroendocrine phenotype. Right. You know, this is evolution within the body. Right. And, and again, this is what's so neat about looking at these particular systems where they're changing. And you can't have unidimensional thought when you're thinking about how to take care of these patients.